This episode is titled, A Son for a Son, and my gosh, you already know what this title means if you watch the episode. Princess Rhaenyra is reeling from the loss of not one, but two children in the season finale, as her child that she was pregnant with was stillborn, and her son, he got eaten by a dragon. Nah. This episode sees Team Black seeking revenge, and just like Aemon and his mother wanting an eye for an eye, in this, we see restitution in a son for a son. This episode is directed by Alan Taylor. Now you might recognize the name from directing, you know, lots of stuff. From the wild world of Westeros and Game of Thrones to the slick suits of Mad Men, Taylor's been behind the camera for some of your favorite shows. He even directed Chris Hemsworth in Thor The Dark World. So yeah, this guy's got some range. Now, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with this show, but for those of you who are new, leave. This is not the video for you. I need you to go watch some of those House of the Dragon season one episodes before watching this, right? I'm gonna be doing some of the explanation of things, but there's a lot going on here. Anyway, this episode opens with a raven flying to a very familiar location. Big surprise that it's a raven, right? These things are basically the Westeros version of Twitter these days. Lots of squawking, not a lot of substance. When we see the raven arrive at Winterfell, I know all my Game of Thrones fans were very familiar and excited to see this place. This is the home of House Stark. Yes, the same home of Ned, Rob, Sansa, and more. But that's not for like another 200 years. Instead, right now, House Stark is led by Rickon Stark in Season 1. He is succeeded by his son Cregan Stark here in Season 2. We don't actually see or know why Rickon passed away, but we do know that his son Cregan is now the Lord of Winterfell and King of the North. The show brings us here right as today is the day that men are being selected to serve as Guardians of the Wall and serve in the Night's Watch. Now, the Night's Watch is basically like the security guard crew for Westeros, except way more hardcore. They're a brotherhood of dudes and maybe a grumpy raven or two who chill at the wall, a giant ice barricade that keeps out the creepy white walker zombies made of pure winter hell from the land of Westeros. But hey, at least they got some sweet black cloaks. Just don't expect them to hold the door for you. We then switch over to the wall and we see this enormous structure right at the arrival of Prince Jaceris Valerian who's come here to try and confirm the support of House Stark in the potential conflict between Queen Rhaenyra and King Aemon. Now, clearly my boy Jaceris has been taking his vitamins and saying his prayers because my guy has grown up in the two years since we last saw him. Now, in the show, I don't think two years has passed at all, so we're just gonna act like he's still a little boy or something, okay? Cregan Stark looks like he hasn't smiled since the last time it snowed in Dorne, so my guy Cregan hits him with some truth bombs when he asks him, what the F do you think we're up here for? You think we just like snow and walls? Jaceris has no idea what to say to that and humbles the F up. Cregan wants to offer him something as a show of support and promises him some of his older soldiers who are capable of fighting and could be considered, I guess, expendable? We then switch to see Princess Rhaenys returning from patrolling the oceans alone with her dragon. We get our first glimpse of Damon, and my guy is as subtle as a brick to the face. This dude rolls up on her in full armor, ready to scrap, talking all this, don't dismount, we're headed right back out to go kill the dragon. Rhaenys is like, I'm tired and you're not the king, so kick rocks. But Damon is pissed. My guy lost his great nephew, stepson, nephew from his wife, niece, Rhaenyra, and I think I'm gonna stop that joke right there because I'm already getting confused. But he's mourning the death of Luke. Rhaenys and Damon get awkwardly close as they talk <laughs> some more, and Rhaenys has the final word and walks off to get some rest. We then switch to Rhaenyra outside, looking rough. I mean, real rough. And we all know why. Rhaenyra just keeps going through grief because she's having the worst week in all of Westeros, right? She just lost her father who finally passed away of that mysterious disease. 
She lost her throne when the high towers conspired against her. She lost her unborn child because of the stress of her family squabbles. And she lost her living, breathing son because of those same family squabbles. All in one week. Like, it, it doesn't get much worse than this. Yet. Anyway, we, we all know just how much Game of Thrones likes to make our heroes suffer, so carry on. We then switch to see Lord Corliss, who is one character I hope we see more of this season. His ship has returned from sea in pretty bad shape with some burn marks and blood all over the place. Now, we know that Lord Corliss had a rough go of it in season one. And, uh, whew, where do I begin? His wife got skipped over when she was supposed to inherit the crown, which instead passed to her younger cousin Viserys. His offer for Viserys to marry his daughter so that he could have a seat at power in King's Landing got rejected. His son got married to Rhaenyra, who proceeded to have a few bastard children that his son still claimed, and now those kids are in line to inherit his kingdom. His daughter passed away from a difficult child labor. He thinks his son died after a conflict with a knight in his own castle. His son-in-law and daughter-in-law marry each other and move into his house and get comfortable with their kids and proceed to have kids of their own. His brother is then killed when he points out the fact that those grandkids aren't really his grandkids and everyone knows it. <sighs> oh, and one of those said grandkids gets eaten by a dragon. I can probably keep going, but you know what? Let's just stop there, okay? <laughs> Corliss starts talking to this dude named Alan of Hull, and we learn that this is the guy that saved Corliss's life. See, back in season one when everything was going to hell, Corliss decided to up and leave and go sailing for a few years with his sailor buddies, just to get his mind off things. He ran into some trouble while out there at sea, I don't know, pirates or something, and he got his throat cut and almost died. Now, we don't know much about this character, like, at all, but I was able to find a hint of what's to come of this character by visiting the social media profile of the actor who plays him. Now, Abubakar Salim is a fairly well-known actor from the video game world and is known from the Assassin's Creed Origins game. And if you check out his profile pic online, you'll notice that he's using his character from the show. But in the image, my guy is decked out in full armor, like he's dressed for war. And I don't know what's coming with him, but I'm excited to find out what's gonna happen that he needs to put on full armor in the upcoming episodes. Corliss's ship is in shambles, but he wants his seaworthy as soon as possible so he can lead the efforts in the upcoming conflict himself. Alan doesn't make any promises, but he'll see what he can do. He returns Lucerus's dagger that was fished from the sea to Corliss, who gifted it to Lucerus when he was named his heir. We then switch to the Red Keep where we see one of the twins is minding guard in King's Landing. Now, yo, real quick, can someone please tell me if this is Eric or Eric? Like, yeah, I'm still confused about the names of these twits. Seriously, who names their kids Eric and Eric? It sounds like a typo. Which one is this? Anyway, one of the twins spots a dragon and we see a familiar sight when we see the guards in King's Landing are ready and they have one of those big ass dragon killing bow and arrows ready. Now, we saw these things in the original Game of Thrones when they were used by the Lannisters to protect themselves from Daenerys' dragons. I like how this episode is dropping these nice Easter eggs for us to get that sense of familiarity before introducing us to something new. They recognize the dragon flying overhead as Vagar, the dragon belonging to Aemon Targaryen. Yo, know, good old one eye. They stand down since this dragon is a friendly. We then head inside King's Landing, where we see King Aegon II approaching his sister wife Helena and asking for the whereabouts of their son, Jaehaerys. And some of you may have already noticed that Helena's a little touched. Like, she's clearly the product of years of Targaryen incest, as she's usually seen as someone who's a little detached from the happenings of the rest of the family. Aegon wants Jaehaerys so he can begin having his son listening in on the meetings of the small council. Once he has the info he needs, he's off to go to handle business when the queen says something interesting before he leaves. And she tells her brother husband about how she's afraid of rats. Now, I recently rewatched season one of House of the Dragon and I have to admit that these rats are a recurring visual in the first season. 
I like how we see them right before something terrible happens. So Helena's comment here feels like meta commentary about how these creatures are used as a sign of trouble. We then switch to see Ooh. Queen Allison Hightower Targaryen. Yeah, I remember the Green Queen, right? And uh, <laughs> she's with Sir Crispin. And good gosh, clearly this man is famished as she helps him with something to eat. And boy, oh boy, it looks like my guy is licking the plate. Now, I suspected something about Sir Crispin in season one, but I figured most of his motivation for aligning with Queen Alicent was more so just because he was pissed and wanted to spite Rhaenyra. But now I'm not so sure. After he finishes eating, it seems like she's a little regretful or guilty feeling, something along those lines, and says something about how they can't do that again. We then switch to the small council, gathering with the Hand, Otto Hightower, and King Aegon in attendance. Also, we have a new master of coin, everybody, as Sir Tyland Lannister has taken a seat on the small council after uh, <laughs> unfortunate circumstances that led to the dismissal of the last master of coin. Tyland is an interesting character as he tried multiple times in season one to get the favor of King Viserys and get a little closer to the Targaryen family. Both Viserys and his daughter pretty much brushed him off at every attempt, so it's interesting to see how the High Towers have seemingly hmm. embraced him and given him a seat of power. The small council gathers to review the circumstances that they find themselves in after the accidental death of Viserys Valerian. Queen Allison is still hoping for peace between the houses, but let's be real. Ain't no coming back from that. Aegon has an interesting moment here as he pretty much orders Sir Tywin to give his son a pony ride right in the middle of the small council meeting. Like, is it me or are there shades of Joffrey in this kid? I mean, he's always been a bit self-absorbed, but now he's showing signs of being vicious. Aemon joins in on the meeting and immediately makes his present felt by offering some tactical advice as the small council urges patience from Aemon. We then switch to see Queen Alicent reuniting with her fake friend Laris Strong. Now, you guys remember this little finger wannabe from season one, and he's pretty much known for instigating fights and gossiping about other people's business, but he's also shown hints of having an ulterior motive. I don't know exactly what it is that he wants, but He's here to tell the queen that there's no need to thank him, he's questioned all of the staff of King's Landing, and he's taken the liberty of handling anyone who could be a traitor. No need to ask him to do it, no thanks are necessary, it's already done. And it's sus as all get out, like my guy just sat here and fired her people and installed his people to spy, I mean protect the queen's secrets without asking, this is his soul. Doesn't smell sus. We didn't switch to see Queen Rhaenyra, who's still sleeping outside. She spots a boat on a nearby beach with some of the guys there talking about dragon wings or something. Rhaenyra rushes over to investigate and... Damn. They done found the wing of Luke's dragon, Vermax. Not exactly the kind of souvenir you want from a beach trip in Westeros, but they found it. But we also see that they found Lucerus's clothes mixed up in their fishing net, and this is rough. Rhaenyra and her dragon Cyrax seem to mourn a little. We then switch to see King Aegon doing more of his kingly duties and listening to the petitions of the peasants of King's Landing, and wow. Like, we see a whole different side of Aegon for a moment. Interestingly, he seems sympathetic to the needs of the people of King's Landing as they ask of things of the crown, and he's willing to oblige. King Aegon listening to the peasants' problems is like watching a Kardashian try to understand the struggles of the working class, bless his heart. This somewhat reminds me of the original Game of Thrones when Daenerys was listening to the needs of the people of Marine. One of those peasants petitioned her because her dragons ate their cattle, and now in this show, we're seeing that this man's sheep were provided as tithing in order to feed the dragons. Aegon hears what his grandfather is saying though, and still wants to know if they can at least return one of this guy's sheep like anything. Like, my guy is actually acting kinda nice. And it's really interesting when you think about it, because on one hand, 
We've seen that Aegon is a rapey, perverted drunkard who never wanted the crown. But on the other hand, he's still King Viserys' son. He's still Kind Alicent's son. And it seems like we're getting our first look at their direct influence on his character. Yes, he's a piece of shit, but he's not the worst piece of shit. He's just playing the role his grandfather manipulated him into playing. His grandfather schools him on how if you help one person, you have to help all of them, which just shows how much of an influence Otto is on his grandson. Again, I like how this show juxtaposes situations from Game of Thrones with House of the Dragon. This reminds me of how Tywin Lannister tried to control his grandson Joffrey when he made him king, but learned the hard way that his grandson had a vicious will of his own. Anyway, Aegon continues listening to the petitions of the commoners, and you can tell he's actually got a heart under all that selfish exterior. Hmm. We then switch to see Aegon climbing those familiar stairs in King's Landing, and waiting for him is Larys Strong, seemingly plotting again. And this time, he's going directly at the king and makes a not so subtle play for the title as hand. He remarks how Otto was viewed as someone who could control King Viserys and Otto was his father's hand. We then switch to see Queen Alicent and her father having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Alicent getting real with her dad about how she wants one thing and her father wants another. He claims that he wants the same thing as her, but she's upset that she keeps getting undermined in the small council meetings by him. She further explains that if he keeps doing this publicly, then her sons are going to take notice and they're going to stop listening to her too. We then switch to the ocean, where we see one of the King's Landing ships getting boarded by the ships of Lord Corliss. And on the boat, we find the White Worm. Now, the White Worm is the woman named Viseria, the woman who was once with Daemon Targaryen before he wedded Lena. He didn't seem to care for her, but I got the impression that she loved him. She was also the one who helped the High Towers find Aegon in that time when he was missing right after King Viserys' death. Daemon is not happy with the White Worm, acting as if she's the one who betrayed him. She sets him straight, that she was just acting on her own and doesn't have any allegiances to Team Green or Team Black. Damon doesn't give a F and he orders the guards to treat her like a traitor to the crown. We then switch to see Queen Rhaenyra finally go inside after being outside for days. Damon walks up on her forgetting that we don't have soul and then starts immediately planning battle strategies. Rhaenyra is not there yet like She's not there at all. She gets to the head of the table and says just four words. I want Aemond Targaryen. And then leaves immediately. We then switch back to Daemon revisiting the White Worm and he wants information. He knows that Myseria has information about the comings and goings in King's Landing and offers her her freedom in exchange for this information. We then switch back to Queen Rhaenyra, who is meeting up with her son, Jaceris, who's seeing her for the first time since the death of Lucerus. He tries to tell her how successful he was in recruiting help. But he breaks down, and he mourns with his mother instead. We then switch back to Queen Alicent, and we see that she's taking some time to say her prayers. You know, like a good reverend queen. And surprisingly, she includes Lucerus in her prayers when lighting a candle. The show then flashes back and forth between this prayer and the funeral that Rhaenyra is having for her son Luke. The only person missing is old stepdaddy Damon. And speaking of Damon, we switch to see Damon sneaking his way into King's Landing using the information he got from Melisaris to get inside. While there, he meets up with someone who seems to be somewhat of a mercenary who also happens to be in a lot of debt. Damon offers some cold hard coin if he sneaks in the King's Landing and kills Prince Aemon Targaryen, which sounds like a solid idea. Think about it. If the assassin is able to kill the prince, then that will immediately take Vagar off the board in the upcoming conflict as Team Green would be down one dragon rider. Interestingly, the mercenary asked, what should we do if we can't find Aemon? We then switch to see Aemon and Sir Crispin plotting the way. 
this time in private away from the small council about the upcoming conflict. This also shows us just how close Aegon and Crispin are to one another as it seems like they're drinking buddies. It's incredible how the kids grew older but nobody else did. Anyway, the Hand enters the room and sees what's happening and immediately dismisses Crispin from the room and starts talking with the prince. Otto wants to keep a firm grip on the kingdom and plotting without his knowledge doesn't really work for him. He reminds Aemon that he and Bagar are the strongest superpower in the world. But the only way for things to work out is if he's patient. We then switch to see the mercenary and the guard that were speaking with Damon earlier. These two are making their way through the sewers of King's Landing and- Wait, what? These people have sewers? Sewers? Yo, I'm pretty sure I remember Tywin getting killed on a shitter in the original Game of Thrones, and something tells me it wasn't the kind that could flush. Anyway, we see the mercenaries surprisingly walking freely throughout the castle, and they even walk right in front of the king, and nobody says nothing. None of the guards, not the king, nobody. And then we see a rat. A, a rat. We know what that means, right? We see a rat. Something messed up is about to happen. We see a rat as these two start making their way further into the castle and making their way all the way up to where Eamon was with the hand just a few moments ago. They can't find them, but they continue their search until they find their way to the king's chambers. One of the staff spots them and doesn't really like what they see and starts running. She gets away, but they end up finding Queen Helena in her chambers, and she's in the bedroom with her two twin children. Now, what's interesting is that these are Aegon's twins, and one of them is a boy and one is a girl. The boy obviously is in line to inherit the crown. They threaten Helena and tell her to point out which one is the boy as they were given an order to take a son for a son. She regretfully and painfully points at one of them. And these two jackasses do the unthinkable when they start to get to work on the kid. Helena grabs the other kid and quietly scuttles off to safety. And she heads to Queen Allison's room, who's in the middle of, uh... Can't you see that she's busy? Helena, as she is, says just four words. They killed the boy. And end credits. And... Wow. Wow. Another kid bites the dust? Westeros must have a serious discount on tiny coffins at this point. And what is up with all these dead kids anyway? I mean, Game of Thrones wasn't afraid to take out a kid or two in its day, but this feels like we're losing kids every week. Poor Helena didn't even want anything to do with any of this. She was pretty content in just sewing clothes and playing with the kids. I really like this episode as it's a nice way to get reintroduced to the happenings of House of the Dragon. We see all of the major players from the show. We see what's happened since we left things off in season one. And we also get an idea of some of the plotting and motivations of the characters heading into season two. I think the most interesting person, to me anyway, is Laris Strong. I mean, yes, there are dragon stories and the mourning of dead children, but this guy right here seems to be plotting five steps ahead of everyone else on this show. He's definitely giving Littlefinger vibes and seems to seek power from the shadows. I am curious to see just what's going to develop from his manipulations of the high towers and just how long it will go on before someone notices. He feels like the perfect antagonist for Otto Hightower, but I don't know. I'm not going to hold my breath on this one as this series is known for subverting expectations when it comes to showdowns. And Rhaenyra... Jeez, she's going through it. And just when you think she's got it together and is ready to scrap, we see, nah, she's still a broken woman. You know, I thought that she would be more vindictive and active in this episode because of that look on her face at the end of last season. But here goes HBO once again, subverting expectations and giving us believable, although unpredictable reactions. Now this season, it looks like it's gonna be another season that's full of surprises, and I can't wait to see what direction things go from here. 
anyway look yo that's all i have for this one if you're new here to the movie blog you're new go ahead and do yourself a favor like subscribe follow me we're going to be doing these videos every week as we break down every episode of the entire season of house of the dragon anyway like i said that's all i have for this one i'm gonna check you all later peace